Hello Booktube, and welcome to your Daily Penguin, our tour through my Penguin Classic wall. We're getting to the end, slowly approaching the end of the first bookcase, which started out with the ancient world, ancient Greece and Rome, ancient Egypt, uh, and has been moving on into the Renaissance, and we've been dealing with some major works. Uh, but today, we are jumping forward. Now, the signpost date that I gave you for a lot of those Renaissance things was 1492 because we had the journals of Columbus, the life of Columbus, and we had the, you know, the, the, uh, oh. oh. <laughs> Who are all those people, Bean? Who are they all? They like you. They think you're the cute. They do. I like you too. <laughs> uh, we, it's, <laughs> we have 1492, so we had Columbus and we had Henry VIII and uh, Catherine of Aragon and all that sort of thing. But uh, we're moving forward, and we're not moving forward into the 1500s, we're moving even forward, forward even further than that, 1645. We'll be moving back to the Renaissance, this is, our, our order is starting to break down, the center cannot hold. <laughs> so, we're, but today we're moving roughly to 1645, that's a good enough year for you to remember, and we're dealing with uh, a woman. <laughs> this is Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle. This is The Blazing World and Other Writings, a collection of her work edited by Kate Lilly for Penguin Classics. And this is a, was a, she was a notorious figure in her day, in the, in the reign of Charles I. And, uh, and Charles, uh, she's a, a fascinating figure in her own right. And for once, when I'm talking about a fascinating figure in history, I might not be just speaking to the rafters in an empty church. It's possible that quite a few people on BookTube might know about Margaret Cavendish already, not from her writings, but from a slim, very good historical novel called Margaret I by Daniel Dutton, which is about Margaret Cavendish and which was utterly charming. Just utterly charming. It's possible that that was your introduction to this person. <laughs> it's possible that you went then and found this volume or whatever else you could find. Uh, she was a fascinating figure in her own day. She, uh, she did not keep to the, the typical sphere of, uh, of a well-bred uh, woman of her time. Instead, she was interested in science. She was interested in nature. She wrote an enormous amount. Uh, unlike a lot of her uh, more optimistic critics, I, I don't overestimate the worth of her writing. I think she's more interesting as a person in history than she is as an author. Uh, I've read this book a couple of times and haven't found anything in it that was even even slightly memorable. And there isn't much uh, that I w that I've read from her that I would consider to be talented. Her biography, her husband, uh, would be a good example of something like that. And quite a few of her letters. There's, there's uh, if I had had my druthers, if I had been the powers that be at Penguin when this volume was under consideration, I would have made it a very different volume. I would have done the whole of her biography or her husband and a bunch of letters. I wouldn't have done these more speculative pieces. I don't think they show her at her strongest. But the, the editor here does a really good job introducing her, a really good job providing critical apparatus for all of the pieces that are included here. Uh, the, the temptation with this author is to ladle on the idea of her being a, a trailblazer in a whole bunch of different genres. And I, I don't think that's fair to her. I, because it, it, you go to, when you hear that before you read the works, you go to the works and are inevitably disappointed. I think. <laughs> uh, and that, that uh, split in opinion was true even in her own day. I'm, I'm on the horns of a dilemma here because John Dryden thought very highly of her writing and Samuel Pepys hated it. Uh, and so on and so forth, right down the line. Her male and female contemporaries either loved her writing or hated it. And it's been my experience reading a lot of those contemporaries that mostly the people who hated her writing have the better argument. Mostly the people who like this author like her for what she was rather than what she wrote. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it just, it, it, it makes this volume a little bit, a little bit as the, as the uh, 21st century says, problematic. Because of course I want to recommend this. Of course I want to recommend it mainly because I want you to get to know Margaret Cavendish. I want you to know this figure in history. She is unbelievably interesting. Uh, but a lot of her, how to put this, uh, without offending all of them, but there's a, a lot of her reputation derives not from her overlooked gem status as a pro stylist, because that isn't always there. It isn't, I would argue, mostly there. 
a lot of her reputation, her literary reputation right now, as we encountered in 2020, is the result of my own profession. <laughs> it's the result of the, the queen of my own profession, the great Virginia Woolf, who wrote a long essay about Margaret Cavendish that was, oh my God, too generous by half, but which was so wonderful in its own right. Her essay was so wonderful in its own right that it caused a whole generation of people to think that this was a giant writer that they had overlooked. That is not true. Margaret Cavendish was not a giant writer that you have overlooked. She's a very interesting writer. You should know her and read her work. But Virginia Woolf overpraised her. It, it's, it's a thing that periodically happens in my profession. Fifty years after Virginia Woolf did that, Gore Vidal did the same thing for Don Powell in an essay that everyone paid attention to and suddenly everyone thought here is uh, a gigantic figure that we have all overlooked when that is not the case. It was then later done years after that for the novelist James Wilcox where all of a sudden everybody read the essay, everybody thought, oh my God, here's a great uh, comedic novelist of manners that we have overlooked. That is not true. <laughs> it's not true. All you have is an author who discovered this figure, a writer in my own profession, a critic, who discovered this figure and thought, gee, you know, that was amazing. <laughs> and then <laughs> I believe that a large part of that happened in this case as well. I think you, if you're charting the ups and downs of Margaret Cavendish's reputation, you will see it's way up here during her own time when everyone was talking about Mad Madge. And then it goes down, down, down here, where it belongs. Well underneath the, even the middle range authors and far below the great authors of the time. And then if you watch that graph, I believe you'll see it jump right back up again when Virginia Woolf's piece started circulating. And I... To me, I consider that more a recommendation to read Wolf's essay, which is in the common reader, than to go out and read everything this author ever wrote. <laughs> that was probably heresy. But nevertheless, that is your Penguin Classic for today, and it is a recommendation. I'm going to keep this video a little short, because I noticed that the other two videos I made today were a little long, one of which may have been the longest video I've ever made. Uh, and uh, th there's just no place for that. I know you people are all trapped at home, but it feels like I'm taking advantage to hoist you with a 40-minute video. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a recommend. There is no, as far as I know, there is no other readily available popular version of this author. This will give you an introduction. It's, it'll do what Penguin Classics do so well. It'll give you an introduction that situates this author in her time, tells you all the details of her life. It'll give you excerpts that are carefully annotated and introduced of all some of her major works. It'll give you a taste, an idea of, of what this author was all about, what it was all like. She definitely belongs in the Penguin Classic lineup. I just don't want, I don't want to oversell it. A lot of people who talk about this author in the past have oversold her, and I don't want to do that because I'm, I'm mindful of your reading time. <laughs> so, so I'm going to use this as a, a recommendation, but it's, I'm recommending the Penguin Classic a little bit more than I'm recommending the author herself, unless you can find a copy of her biography of her husband, which is uh, eloquent and remarkable and also uh, unguardedly tender in some of the most unlikely places. They had a remarkable union. I think they loved each other. So that is a worthwhile book to find, certainly unprecedented in the realm of letters for anyone to do that, So for any woman to do that about her husband, as far as I know, unprecedented, certainly at that length and at that level of literary achievement, unprecedented. Uh, and that was what, well, anyway, anyway, you know what I mean. We're, we're right down the middle here. I recommend this volume if you want to know more about Margaret Cavendish. I just want you to be on your guard against uh, overpraisers of her work, and I definitely recommend Margaret the First by Daniel Dutton. God, that'll take you, it'll take you an hour to read, and boy, oh boy, will you be glad you did. So, that's your Penguin Classic for today. Tomorrow we will probably be back in the sunny slopes of the Renaissance itself. Who knows? <laughs> Who can tell anymore? And it's going to get worse. Once we're done with this bookcase, then all bets are off. So, <laughs> as long as you know that, I will wrap this up for now, and I will be back. Thank you, Book 2.